things that we really want to do with this next panel is we've been talking a lot about sort of big macro issues. And in some ways, I sat in the back of the room and felt as though we were talking about issues, um, and they seemed very, very big. And what I want to try to do with this panel is start to take it down a little bit and really start to talk about what does this all really mean for individuals and their day-to-day -day lives? And what does it mean? And what are the what, how, are, how are millennials actually adapting to this new environment? and succeeding in the new environment. And that's a lot of the focus is, is on today, but also to try to talk a little bit about what does the future bring? Where does this go? And so we're going to really group this in looking at um, financial health and stability. The, the title of the panel actually talked about the future of building wealth. And I guess one of my takeaways from this morning's conversation is I'm not sure that even those words are even the right words for a millennial audience. And I'm not sure wealth actually is the right description for what, we're, what we want to talk about. So maybe one of the things we'll do is just think about this. And when we get to the Q&A part, I'd love to hear people's kind of just even op-eds on this issue of even the idea and the notion of, of wealth building. Um, I am joined today by four colleagues. You can please look at their bios. Each one of them has deep expertise in this um, area. Rick O'Brien, who's currently with um, at Harvard University. Tim Chen, the CEO of NerdWallet. Uh, Rohit Chopra from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And Jennifer Tesher, who's the CEO of the Center for Financial Services Innovation. So let me, um, let's start off by asking each of you to share some quick reflections on the financial challenges and opportunities that are f facing millennials as they try to achieve economic success today and for tomorrow. Let's start, work. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Brandon. Really excited to be on this panel. I'm really excited to engage in this conversation, so I want to keep uh, these opening thoughts brief. Uh, as a millennial, I just wanted to start by, I was doing some reflecting on what might make millennials think differently about wealth and financial management. Uh, and as we've heard echoed uh, uh, several times this morning, you know, we're a generation that coming of age was defined as times of, of booms and busts. So the 90s, when we were, you know, many of us were quite young, you know, it was a story where everyone was getting rich, the dot-com era, uh, uh, you know, everyone was, uh, you know, broadly, anyone who was invested in the market was making real gains. And then we saw that collapse. Uh, and, you know, that was really, for me, it was when, you know, I was in high school, the dot-com uh, collapse. Uh, it wasn't just the dot-com. I, as a pretty nerdy fourth grader, uh, uh, bought uh, $100 worth of stock in baseball cards, which also uh, collapsed around the year 2000. Um, so when we're talking about you know, following that with then in, you know, in, your, in your late teens and 20s, watching the housing uh, prices go up and then again collapse, when we hear this idea that millennials are a bit more conservative, more risk averse, I think we all kind of see where that might be, be, be coming from. I think the second thing that also defines this generation uh, in many ways, is its relationship with uh, technology, as we've all talked about, but how that's reshaping the way we interact with finances. And I think that we're an interesting bridge generation uh, in that you know I still remember watching my parents you know writing uh, a check at the grocery store, but yet I have never actually sat down and balanced a checkbook. Um, so my experience, you know, in the 90s with you know ATMs and uh, uh, and the debit card, and now today, you know, I don't have a kind of a personal relationship with with financial institutions with bankers. And so I think the way that we, we deal with our money, we think about our money is uh, in some ways more fragmented and depersonalized, but uh, I'm sure as we're going to hear from folks on this panel, I think a lot more uh, uh, opportunity and power and potential there for how we reconceptualize how we uh, manage our money. Uh, I, I did want to just take a few thoughts, to, a few minutes to throw out some ideas when we're thinking about policy uh, and we're thinking about how can we actually move the needle here and actually help this generation build wealth, from which we heard this morning that uh, the, the money was are, are a bit far behind on this measure. Uh, if we're talking about wealth and public policy, I think the first thing we have to do is actually think about a suite of policies that makes wealth less important. So we know that we've heard that you know, for many reasons there's always going to be tremendous uh, wealth inequality and we can all try to think about ways to kind of to, to compress that distribution and make sure everyone has a piece of the pie. Uh, but we also want to be thinking of those policies that, that, that make sure that you can uh, afford higher education, that you can uh, live uh, and, and potentially even own your own home and you can have a secure retirement even if you don't have massive amounts of wealth. And so there's a whole suite of policies we need to think of uh, that are important for actually weakening the link between wealth 
wealth and life chances. But we know that wealth is going to be deterministic. So in thinking through how do we build wealth, uh, first, for a panel that has the word wealth in the title, uh, I, you know, I'm going to take a, a page out of, of Ray's playbook and talk about, we also really need to talk about debt. We need to have a balance sheet perspective. And when a lot of the policies that we have out there, uh, uh, some of which are great, uh, some of which could be improved, that are designed towards you know, building wealth, they're about savings and investment. But there's not as many policies targeted towards actually helping people and incentivizing people to, to, res to pay down debt, to do so responsibly, and importantly, giving people access to high quality debt products. We all need debt uh, uh, you know, to help manage our finances in the short run and the long run. And so that needs to be part of our conversation when we're talking about building wealth uh, from more of a global perspective. Uh, second, I think for this generation, flexibility is really important. For a group that you know, was really stunted in their labor market development because of the Great Recession, uh, you know, calls for increasing you know, participation in retirement plans or increasing the amount of money you put in those plans uh, are really not being heard because that's just not the, the timeline that people are thinking on. Right now it's how do I manage day to day? How do I start to get that initial cushion that I need? So when we're talking about uh, you know, opportunities and, I, and, and, and policy levers for building savings, we have to find ways to meet people where they are. And the millennials are still focused on more of a, 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 a short term, how do I kind of give myself that, that buffer that I need Need to actually have some financial stability that will then allow me to look further ahead. And so I think the degree to which we can take you know, the big policies of focus on retirement and expand them to more kind of flexible and dynamic measures would be really great. And the last thing I would say when it comes to policy is that we need to meet millennials, like we do with every generation, uh, where their priorities are and where their proclivities are. And so this means things like if we're seeing this you know, increased taste for you know, moving back to the cities, for having an urban lifestyle, and yet we want to still promote home ownership, maybe we need to think of non-traditional ways to do that. So things like you know, shared equity or sweat equity, other pathways to home ownership that allow people to live the life they want, the American dream they want, but not on this kind of standard 30-year mortgage, 20% down uh, that, that worked for a previous generation. Uh, we've also heard you know, things like making sure the tax code is reflective of the way millennials are actually forming households uh, of, on a range of measures, including you know, this rise in cohabitation, which will be interesting to see if, if that continues to be a trend. Uh, and then for this risk-averse group, what are other ways to engage people to, to get them saving and to get them to kind of uh, uh, have this longer-term perspective? So I think that they, while it might not be the group that's constantly investing and following the stock market, there are other really smart innovations like prize link savings that I think might be one way to engage people and, and smartly incentivize uh, the development of new savings. So I'll leave it there. I just want to say that a week ago when we spoke, you actually said you weren't sure what you were going to say. You did a really good job. <laughs> that was excellent. <laughs> I was a little nervous a few days ago. Okay. <laughs> Tim, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your take on the issue and actually uh, why don't you start with us. I think the most interesting thing I've heard today is Nerd Wallet. What is Nerd Wallet? Okay, sure, sure, Betty. Uh, so Nerd Wallet uh, is, a, is a website that puts knowledge in your wallet. So it was really, I really created NerdWallet uh, to address a big problem I saw. A lot of friends and family uh, were having a lot of uh, problems with decision making. So it could be any sort of question out there like, you know, what is a great rate on my mortgage uh, to what do I do about my stock options? There's not quite democratized access to great answers on these problems. Sometimes one specialized financial advisor out there is really the guy you need to talk to to figure out what to do. Uh, sometimes there's a huge billion dollar plus advertising budget that you're fighting against from uh, Samuel L. Jackson pitching the Quicksilver card. Um, that kind of makes it very unclear uh, what the best decision out there is. Um, so uh, we created NerdWallet to really fight some of these structural issues. And uh, yeah, I, I guess there's two big themes I want to talk about today uh, or, or talk through. Uh, one is decision making. I don't think financial literacy is possible. The more, um, the more I learn about this industry and the more opaqueness that I dig through, the more I realize that there are just infinite numbers of industries that exist around obfuscating uh, certain pricing, information, et cetera. And there's not really a way to break through that um, unless 
something structurally changes, um, it's extremely difficult to uh, help the masses of millennials out there understand the benefits of uh, even signing up for subsidized health care, for example. Uh, and so there's the second big issue, which is distribution. Uh, the biggest challenge we've faced as a business is just to make people aware that we exist. And I think the same, uh, even with the best policies out there, the same challenges really uh, will, ha will happen there. So I think it's about decision making and distribution. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Rohit. I work at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some reflections about what is it like and where are we, particularly with millennials, in the seven years since the onset of the financial crisis. So September of 2008, excuse me, six years. September of 2008, we really see a massive change, uh, not just in the financial markets, but that ultimately trickled throughout multiple sectors of the economy. And I think one thing we haven't really talked about enough is that the rising levels of student debt in America is really one of the aftershocks of that financial crisis. So many families lost home equity. They lost value in their retirement plan. They frankly just lost a lot of savings because many people were unemployed. State governments cut support to higher education. And all of these forces coming together led to a lot more student debt. And if we look at the wage numbers, it's even a worse picture. We see that, of course, you're going to make so much more money over the course of your life if you have a college degree. Nobody disputes that. But actually, the difference between college graduates and non-college graduates, that college wage premium, it's only growing because non-college graduates' wages are in free fall. Actually, for college graduates, the starting wage has not grown when adjusted for inflation since about 2001. So the combination of basically flatter declining wages with a lot more debt may actually have a domino effect on the rest of the economy. The fact that people are more likely to live with roommates or live at home, that may not be a cultural phenomenon. That actually might be a very realistic economic reality for millions of people. We see the, number, the home ownership rate numbers. We see participation in, in employer-sponsored retirement plans. But there's a legitimate question there. Should I pay down my debt? Should I save for retirement? Should I save for a down payment? These are hard questions with a smaller pot of money to pay for it all. And what I think is a bigger problem for the financial system more broadly is persistent distrust by young people, particularly of large financial institutions. Many people who were millennials saw their parents foreclosed upon while they were in college or just afterward. Often these, these foreclosures may have been illegal. They find their own issues with their student debt and today, actually, the CFPB released a report describing all of the complaints and data in the private student loan market, which was essentially a market that boomed, like the subprime mortgage market in the years leading up to the crisis. And now they're having a tough time negotiating terms on those loans, leading to more and more and more defaults, which ruins credit reports and makes the whole uh, cycle even more vicious. So I think you're right. It is structural. Part of it is getting financial institutions to follow the law. And the other part is really thinking about how do we prevent all of this student loan debt from infecting other sectors of the economy. It's not going to be an immediate crisis. It could be a slow drag. Less people wanting to start a small business, less people wanting to save enough for retirement. And it's something we've got to address with multiple policy tools and it's not just going to be solved, like you said, with financial literacy. If people don't have enough money to pay that debt, it's not going to help them to educate them to pay it on time. So we have a lot we have to work on, and there's a lot going on, but I think we need to really redouble our efforts to understand what's happening at a granular level with young people, rather than just talking about it in averages and platitudes. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to take Brandy up on her initial question about the overall framing for this panel. 
Uh, and I would agree that um, if I had been naming this panel, I don't think I would have named it uh, Wealth because attitudes are dramatically shifting in this country. Not just millennials' attitudes, uh, but Americans in general. Um, when you ask Americans how they define success, today they are far more likely to uh, define success as being about health uh, than they are about wealth. Um, the, the vast majority of Americans actually would say that, and they would define health in a variety of ways. They talk about physical health, certainly, but they also talk about knowing how to spend well, being financially healthy. Uh, and this isn't just a trend um, post-recession. It's a little bit like the comment that was made earlier that the recession, in a way, just laid bare a set of structural challenges in the economy. This is a 20-year trend. Uh, that we've been watching over the course of time. And I think the rise of millennials um, is uh, in no small part contributing uh, to this shift in attitudes. So before we can really focus on wealth building, we've got to think about health building. And as you've heard today, the health, the financial health of millennials is precarious. They lack a cushion to weather ups and downs. They're more likely than, uh, than any other generation to have underwater mortgages. They're drowning in student debt, as you've just heard. And they're averse to credit, which in many ways could be a very good thing, but it may turn out to be a bad thing because it may reduce their future prospects uh, for credit when they really need it. Um, they're more likely to use a range of financial providers, apps, tools, uh, in order to manage their day-to-day -day financial lives. Um, and while this a la carte approach can be beneficial, it also makes it more challenging to weave together the strands uh, of one's financial life into a coherent, a coherent quilt. <clears throat> Gone are the days of 30 years ago when your uh, grandmother or mother, actually back then it would have been your grandfather or father, uh, would have walked into the uh, local bank um, and would have had a relationship with the person behind the desk and would have really lived the vast majority of, the, of their financial life um, through that institution. Those days are, are, are long gone. Um, they're not coming back. Um, and the real question is what's going to replace it in a way that's going to enable millennials and the rest of the country, frankly, to sort of get their financial houses in order. So I see a tremendous uh, number of challenges, but I'm also buoyed by um, a lot of opportunities. The fact is um, the rise of millennials co coincides with unbelievable uh, changes and disruption in the financial services sector. And that means that they're really paying attention. The private sector is very much paying attention to all of you. Um, and they can't help but not pay attention to you because you're enormous as a generation. You are their customers of the future, and they have to figure out how to serve you. Um, so this is a, a really powerful moment to be influencing the practices and business models of the private sector um, in a way that's going to work for um, this generation. Now, mo money for millennials is nearly completely digital. About 88% of millennials do their banking online and half use their smartphone to bank. And while uh, smartphone usage and online banking is uh, increasing for everybody, it's certainly heaviest among millennials. Uh, but it also means that your expectations are different about how you want to engage. And it also means that you are not that excited about um, uh, sort of the biggest and most traditionally trusted, to your point, financial services companies. Of the 10 most hated brands by millennials in any category, all four of the biggest banks are in that bottom 10. I'm sorry, Brandy. <laughs> I'm sorry to share that with you. Um, um, sorry. Um, uh, and that leads about three-fourths of millennials to be more excited about a new offering in financial services from Google, Amazon, Apple, PayPal, or Square than from a traditional bank. Now, on the one hand, this makes them far less costly to serve. Um, it also makes money social <clears throat> and communal. In fact, um, I think one of the most positive aspects of this is I think that the taboo around talking about money and talking about one's finances are going to very quickly fall away. Um, you know, that wasn't something you, your grandparents talked about with other people, or even my parents necessarily. But um, the uh, willingness of millennials and interest in sharing all kinds of personal information and details and really using one's social network as a support and a way to get advice um, is incredibly powerful and I think holds real opportunity in this arena.
Um, I also think the notion that money is communal uh, is something that we're learning from our financial diaries work, um, which City and the Ford Foundation and the VR Network have been supporting. Uh, and if you think about it, financial services is a very individual activity today. You, you, maybe you own an account with a spouse, or your mortgage is possibly with a spouse, but most products are individually owned, but money doesn't work that way, um, uh, particularly for millennials. And so for a generation who's really wary of credit, and very, in many cases, thinking about entrepreneurship, you know, Kickstarter makes a lot more sense than you know, leveraging your, a credit card, for instance. So what else might we do to create these kinds of opportunities um, uh, that aren't going to drag millennials further down by being more mired in debt? Uh, I think the last thing I'll say is um, home ownership is important from a macroeconomic perspective. But I think we've got to start with uh, where people are. And that's just not where people are right now. Uh, and so I really like what, um, what was said earlier by Rourke about um, thinking about policies that make wealth less important and thinking differently about paths to home ownership or ownership in general of, uh, of, of a place you might live, whether that's a home or something else. Um, I, you know, but I want to close on this idea that from a policy perspective, I think it would be really powerful to think about what might the government's role be if we thought that the goal was advancing financial health. What would it be? You know, today we think about the government's role as, in, as helping to build wealth. So we see tax credits. <clears throat> we see incentive. Uh, we see the government incentivizing a variety of behaviors around wealth building. But what if the government was actively involved in helping people promote financial health? Think about it in the public health arena. The government has an active role and responsibility to help promote public health. You see letter grades on the doors of restaurants in terms of their health and cleanliness. What if that were the case with banks and financial services providers? That actually might be very helpful to someone like NerdWallet. Um, so I just think that that's a really interesting frame for thinking about what future policy uh, uh, solutions might look like in this arena. Great. So let me actually pick up on this issue of, the, of trust. Because I think that it's one of the, the characteristics of the millennial generation is, and I think it's both a, a, a strength and a challenge, is the questioning and the redefining of the role institutions play in our lives. And I think that while I agree with you, Jennifer, that the socialization of money, that we talk more freely about these issues, I think there's still a lot of distrust of the institutions that are engaged. And so let me just sort of open it up to the panel and ask your questions. And you started this off a little bit, Tim, when you said the answer is not financial education. One of the ways you, you gain trust with people is if they feel safe. So what is it, if there were things that you could suggest that would drive more sort of people feeling more safety, which then has an impact on trust, and these could either be recommendations um, related to the private sector or the public sector. And let's, let's start there. Let okay, start. sure. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll touch on two pretty interesting examples from the private sector. Uh, so most of the people uh, in NerdWallet's office uh, buy things off Amazon now. Uh, people trust that the reviews are pretty comprehensive and that the prices are within reason and that fulfillment will happen. Uh, if you rewind to 10 years ago, there was kind of a disaggregated huge set of people selling things online and that trust wasn't there. And I guess um, I, I think consumers have kind of a sixth sense around when they're being sold, when their information is not comprehensive, and when something's just not quite right. Um, and then they, they quickly build up the trust after some positive interactions. Um, I, think, I think that's a bit lacking in financial services today. I mean, um, you see billion dollar plus advertising budgets from Geico, Allstate, Capital One, Bank of America. City. I don't know about city, <laughs> right? Um, and and so I mean, if you if you go into a travel agency in the '90s and you sit across the desk from someone with a computer monitor turned the other way and a brochure with like three options in it, and you don't really know how the other person's being paid or compensated, you feel like something is off. And I feel like relationship banking today, I mean, still accounts for one third of credit card originations uh, based on our survey data. Direct mail is another third. And I, I think consumers sense that something is a little off. Uh, so I, I don't know if this is something the CFPB mm -hmm. could play a role in or some private enterprise like Amazon. Can I, can I, 
I want to ask you a question, Tim, because sure. I, um, I think this idea of online marketplaces to help people sort and make sense of financial products and help make it make an informed decision about what might be best for them um, have a really uh, there's a real, there's a real potential for them. I'm excited about them, but in the same way that there's a, a perceived conflict of interest with hmm, how's the person sitting across the desk from me at a financial institution compensated, I think that we have the same potential problem with online marketplaces. It'd be interesting to hear a little bit more about your own business model and how the cust your customers know that um, the products that you might be featuring in your lists aren't, be aren't there because um, uh, they're not, uh, being top of the list isn't open to the highest bidder on the back end for you. Yeah, I think there's, this is uh, absolutely a huge trend in internet. So you see the kind of web 1.0, 2.0 companies out there, very short term focused, trying to maximize their revenue per page view by basically auctioning off every spot on the page. One example of this uh, was Yahoo Search uh, with their Overture acquisition. It's not that their technology was bad, but you could sense that something was kind of wrong when you started clicking on search results and you started getting weird things coming out the other side. Google moved all their ads up to the top and down the side and clearly demarcated that the things in the middle were to be trusted. And I think consumers either consciously or unconsciously realized this and started trusting them. Um, the same with Amazon. Amazon, the, the way they lay out their page is highly suboptimal for short-term revenue. Um, but in the long run, it was great for lifetime customer value because people started coming back over and over again. So I think it's kind of a short-term versus long-term focus that um, defines the, the internet companies that have really broken through, like say Yelp. Well, there's still questions about Yelp, but um, a lot of other verticals out there. I think that this same trend though is ap so broadly applicable about, I think of the sort of prerequisites of trust in financial services as being um, accountability and transparency. So I think there's a general trend toward greater transparency of all types of institutions, whether they be government, corporations, whomever. And people are accustomed to knowing key data, key information, or just the fact that they disclose it does elevate people's levels of trust. And I, I hate to go back to you know, the, the mortgage meltdown and the illegal foreclosures, but what I think people were learned in, in some ways was that the person who gave them the mortgage they thought, why would they give this to me if I couldn't pay it back? And they didn't know that there was a global financial system that was securitizing those mortgages. It's not a natural thing to know. But all of a sudden, they are starting to be more suspicious about it. And then when they see that they've somehow been harmed and there's no accountability by the institution who harmed them, that really undermines the trust. And I think that's really where we have problems. If we do not have a law-abiding financial services industry that is clear, upfront, and transparent, we will not be able to rebuild that trust. I think we're starting to do it with mortgages. We're starting in other places as well. But I, I, that's why you're going to see a lot of technology companies have a huge edge. Um, in offering financial products compared to other financial institutions because the modus operandi of transparency and accountability is just completely different. So, Mark, I want to ask you a question about um, savings. So, one of the things we talked a lot about today so far, and I'm going to come back to the issue of, of debt and student debt because it's so incredibly prevalent, and I think it's a very interesting idea that was raised also, which is how do you balance your use of debt, but the balance is also with both your consumption and your savings. I think rather than make assumptions, when we use this word wealth, we sort of maybe have this notion that we're talking about these complicated savings vehicles, long-term savings. Can you talk a little bit about the ways that you see um, this generation actually being able to create that financial safety net th for themselves and through savings, and then some ideas that are actually on the table from a policy standpoint, and on, any of the pan panelists can join in, that are on the, um, in the policy agenda related to increasing savings? Sure, yeah, I mean, going back to kind of the, my opening remarks, I think that to get people to actually kind of 
pay attention and be able to kind of uh, uh, be brought along with, to the notion that you know savings is 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 not only something good and aspirational that you should do, but something you actually can do. It's you have to make it accessible and, and flexible. And I think that's where uh, you know as we see kind of the, the the boomers are freaking out about retirement and that's kind of taking over kind of the master narrative. Uh, you know, there's this millennial generation that says, wow, retirement is is not only so far from where my head is right now. I don't even think I'm going to retire. The nature of work is changing. I think there's a lot of hand-waving of, I hope that's going to figure itself out. I'm trying to figure out myself right now. And so that's why I think kind of demonstrating to people uh, 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 that savings isn't something about you know socking away money for, for a very long time. It can be something that is not only kind of a month-to-month -month buffer, but even kind of this day-to-day -day smoothing of income. And I think that's where the, the savings conversation gets lost, is that we, we always think that it has to be, it's something to do with putting money aside for some future, be it to, to fund an emergency or to, uh, you know, for, you know, buy a car or down payment or kind of these big lofty goals. But really, savings is, is, is a very fundamental part of kind of your day-to-day -day money management. And I think that's uh, part of what's being missed. And, and that's what I think a lot of these new uh, uh, financial technology companies are really kind of uh, springing up around and trying to give people tools for ways to uh, sequester their money, allocate their money, do mental accounting, all these other kind of brands we're using, which is just really getting people into the habit of savings and trying to have that kind of foresight to think a little bit ahead of, oh, I have a bill due at the end of the month, but my paycheck you know, doesn't come until two days later. How do I kind of manage my money in that short term? And then if there's a way that we can piggyback off of on that mentality and you know, try to get people to say, okay, well, at the same time, is there a way you know you can pay yourself first, or you can give yourself a little bit of a cushion, and that's something you can get you know people into this idea of the savings habit, and then you can start to move towards these longer-term goals. So you know, I think a lot of the policies uh, that are out there right now, as we've talked to you, know, focus on retirement, home ownership, uh, uh, and we could be thinking of ways to you know bring these tax credits, make them refundable, and actually allow you to match money that you put into much more flexible savings products. And I'd even be for you know uh, you know a, a traditional savings account or, or a savings bond or something that has a really uh, uh, that is truly flexible, not just you know thinking about uh, uh, some of these you know retirement products that you could potentially tap in an emergency. And, and I would just add that I agree with that. But if we're going to go that direction, we have to redefine what success looks like because success can't be oh no six months later. The money that was saved isn't there anymore. Well, the question is, what did it enable the person to Absolutely. do that they wouldn't have been able to do? Or maybe they were going to use a worse option as a result, and we're just not there yet um, right. in that thinking. Even folks who've, who've sort of uh, embraced this idea of we need to think shorter term still are measuring savings in kind of an, an old school way, and um, it's not going to help us advance our policy goals. Absolutely. So, Tim, you are. Uh, you actually work with consumers directly. What are some things that you see, some of the financial behaviors that you see um, among millennials? Uh, so it's interesting. Our, our traffic is disproportionately uh, our traffic is disproportionately millennial, and it kind of uh, is reflective of, uh, I think, a certain type of behavior, where millennials are more likely to proactively seek answers online. Um, I think. If, if you survey a broad population, uh, people disproportionately ask Uncle Bob for solutions. Uncle Bob doesn't always know the best answer, and so, so that's pretty interesting. Um, I, I, did, I, I do want to kind of touch on the last point as well, which is, um, I mean, you, you may think of savings as also a, a series of making great decisions at very pivotal points in your life, and technology enabling um, the distribution to do that. So for example, choosing a college major may have a much bigger impact on you than uh, deciding not to drink a Starbucks. And so the question is, can we provide transparency along the way at various pivotal points in time? I think technology might be able to enable that. So let me ask uh, about technology. Anything you see in the marketplace, excluding Nerd Wallet, <laughs> any of you, that's really, you think, a game changer? What do you think is going to change the relationship the millennials have to money or um, help build this trust? 
So just to jump on the on the Go social ahead. point, I, I find that the, the, the social integration or the integration of money into social media uh, and um, uh, the dialogue that it's sparking is, I think, the most exciting. And I don't want to list companies, but but the, the ones out there that are really kind of making savings kind of a, a joint uh, venture. So say, you know, you and your fiance want to save for the wedding, and then you can kind of go back and forth, and you know, there are challenges, and you can challenge each other to be saving, uh, or these new, uh, uh, you know, ways to transfer money between friends, where you actually are tagging what the money's for, and then everyone's seeing on Facebook that that $100 was someone you owed for that fun time in Atlantic City, like that makes the money cool all of a sudden. And I think that these kind of ways to integrate uh, 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 money into our kind of already, you know, existing kind of social media conversations, I think are really exciting. If anything, they're just opening the beginning of a dialogue that I really hope will make this generation different than the ones before it. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give the panel the test I was warning them about earlier. So how many of you on this panel use Venmo? No, 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 Tim. I've heard of it. You're messing me up here, <laughs> right? Uh, how many in the audience? Venmo users? Yeah. Um, so Venmo is a is a P to P, a person to person uh, payments tool. Um, and a friend and colleague of mine wrote a blog recently where he was talking about. Um, what he calls the Venmo line, that this is a way to draw um, a generational distinction because if you're under 30, you're probably using this tool, you've heard of it, um, it's very popular, it's a great way to split the bill or do a variety of other things in a very social way, tag it. Um, and if you're over 30, you're like, what is that and why would anyone do that? <laughs> um, and there is, it, it, I'm sure it's no accident that Brandy and I are sort of bookending this uh, panel up here. Uh, we're a little bit arranged by age, uh, for better or for worse. Um, so I do think that um, one way to think about Brandy's question is to think about um, what uh, millennials expect. And I think they expect a few things. Um, they expect one-click convenience, right? So uh, to use the Amazon example, you know, I can go on in 30 seconds and have and bought a, a book, literally. Um, uh, I can, uh, and, and so why can't I do that with my money? Uh, there's uh, more interest in function than form. So I don't really care if it's a checking account or a savings account or, or a CD or a, you know, what is it? I just care about the things I need to be able to accomplish. It's why simple um, uh, has been so popular with this idea of safe to spend balance. So instead of just saying, well, here's how much money you kind of have, but this check didn't clear yet and making it very complicated, they do all that work for you and say, based on how much money you have and how much money you've told us to set aside for bills you have over the next 30 days and any other goals you have, here's how much you actually have left that's truly safe to spend. Right? They've essentially taken the guesswork out of it and optimized for you your cash flow. So I'm particularly particularly interested in solutions that enable that optimization. Um, uh, uh, Low-income uh, consumers, whether they're millennials or anybody else, um, are extremely challenged uh, uh, with managing their liquidity, whether it's because of income volatility or mistiming or other kinds of things. And with technology, that doesn't, it shouldn't be that hard, right? Uh, we should be able to solve for that. Um, I think the other thing that we've talked about here, and it relates a little bit to trust, um, is this idea, this expectation around um, individual control. I want to control it, not the institution controlling it for me. And so when I think about that, I think a lot about cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. Um, how many of you own Bitcoin or, or have transacted any, any Bitcoin? Who actually understands how Bitcoin works? Yeah, right. But, Very excellent. Oh, okay. Good. Um, so I'm with you. I, I don't think it makes any sense that we should be able to get Bitcoin out of the ATM or we can go buy a latte with a Bitcoin. Who cares? Um, but the more interesting thing about Bitcoin is that it lacks centralized control. Um, um, and um, by doing so, it is imminently scalable and extraordinarily inexpensive way to move money and, frankly, other kinds of um, important objects or documents where you want to make sure that it only gets transferred one time and one time only. Uh, so I think that has enormous potential um, and could dramatically change the way in which we all engage with our money. Um, so I, I think there is a lot of um, excitement, but I, I want to be careful because I don't think technology is the solution to all of our problems. Right. Um, I think technology is a tool. Uh, but um, the, these fundamental issues of financial health that we're talking about here, technology really is only a tool. I don't think it's the answer. Great. So 
So I'm going to open it up to some questions. And I actually have a request. I would be very curious if there was a millennial in the audience that would be willing to actually share sort of their viewpoint on what they kind of think about their ability to plan financially for the future. Because I think that one of the things we're hearing is that you're living, you have a very different set of experiences. And the ability to be able to um, ad adapt to changes in a job, to income volatility, to a very, a, a, a population group that moves often, that does not stay in one place, where family structures are changing and choices about um, how to build a, uh, you know, to either have a financial relationship with someone or not. And I'd be curious just to hear kind of the, your outlook and your viewpoint. Unless, the other side is, people can ask other questions. <laughs> And sort of your experience. Okay. Okay. Let's get you a mic. Let's get you a mic. <clears throat> Hi. I'm not, um, I don't want to offer my experience, but I just have a question uh, regarding all of these issues. How do you apply those to millennials who are of the lowest income levels, people who are simply trying to survive and who are learning those survival techniques from past generations. All of this makes sense, but how do you capture those that are really on the fringe? And how do we bring them to a point where financial literacy is important, but so is day-to-day -day survival? So I would just share that I think we should make it clear that those on the lowest end of the scale are in no way fringe. It is very mainstream to be living paycheck to paycheck as a young person. So yes, it's very important to talk about long-term wealth building, but I think in terms of survival, right. we do have some real issues about how people can just stay afloat on whether it be, it's not really credit card debt, that's more, it was more a Gen X issue, but really the big liability is paying rent and paying student loans. Interesting, less so auto loans in this, in, of millennials. And I think what you're finding is that people sometimes are searching for help often with, and, and we oversee a lot of student loan companies, servicers, debt collectors, and don't feel that they're getting accurate information on how to stay afloat. We have seven million Americans now in default on $100 billion in student loans, and most of those defaults were avoidable if the loan servicer had enrolled that borrower in a program that they could pay even $0 a month and stay afloat. Huge disconnect with the responsibility of the borrower and the responsibility of the loan company and that's something that we need to fix. I think it goes more broadly, though, that you know, macro wage trends are just really not good for a large segment of the population, including those, uh, including many with college degrees. Unfortunately, I want to, I want to try to put a finer point on what you said, and maybe not be so polite because I'm glad you raised this issue. Um, it's very easy for us to say, "Wow, all millennials really have it bad." And um, it's a generational thing. But I think we would be missing the point to not put um, an income and uh, race lens on the issue. Because um, millennials are a big group, and they're not all the same. And they don't all face the same issues. And they don't all come from the same place and bring the same sort of baggage or historic challenges. Um, and by far, people of color, regardless of their age, have it worse off when it comes to their financial issues and financial struggles. And um, the financial crisis just made it worse. Um, so I think it's important to acknowledge that. Um, I, 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 I will also echo something you said, which is um, uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't forget that there's also an income problem here. Um, and no, no, no great technology or new financial whiz bang product is going to solve that. And we should just be honest about that. Um, uh, and uh, I do think it's important for us to think about strategies, policy strategies, private sector strategies, um, uh, that really segment the audience 
um, so we can be dealing with this issue. So I appreciate you raising it. And, and I would just add, I think one of the reasons why I started my pun of policy kind of uh, prescriptions with we got to make wealth not matter is because you know, there's always going to be tremendous inequalities in wealth, and the degree to which we can kind of weaken that link between wealth and life chances is, is critically important, or we're just going to be reproducing the same inequality over and over again. When it comes to managing money, I think a lot of people up and down the income uh, uh, distribution aren't that good at it, but the consequences are just much worse for those at the bottom. You know, they have no slack, kind of whatever the, the language might be. And so uh, 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 it's really fascinating because a lot of times, uh, uh, you know, we're talking about how, you know, low income people, we're asking low income people to be more prudent and effective with their money management than everyone else in the population because it matters for them more. And that's a kind of a really interesting, uh, 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 you know, an unfair way to approach these questions of financial literacy that we're expecting uh, 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 low income folks to be much better at money management because it, it actually matters to, to, to their consequences. If I screw up, it'll be okay. Uh, and one of the reasons why uh, I think there is this big difference and something we don't talk about is this interaction between you know, the formal, the individual, how they manage their money and their various you know, bank accounts or, or whatever, and the family and the social network that's behind them. And so I think a lot of what we're seeing in, in this kind of uh, uh, this generation that's launching into the labor force are you know, those people who have the parents they can always kind of turn to, they can rely on, whether it's sleeping in the basement or whether it's actual financial support, you know, or the, uh, you know, the ability to be supported for that unpaid internship that finally gets them the job, uh, or when the car breaks down, you know, the parents can take care of it. That is very also unevenly distributed. So again, you have some parts of the uh, uh, income distribution, some groups of people are much better able to, you know, work on building their own wealth because they have, uh, you know, a family social safety net that they can rely on so they're not constantly maxing out kind of whatever little nest egg they're able to build up. And so this interaction between, you know, the social network and the, and the family social safety net you can bring to bear uh, uh, is going to be really important for how your finances are, are, are going to be determined now and in the future. I, I think that's really interesting and important because I'm now going to argue against myself. Um, what you lose when you say, no, it's not about wealth, it's about health, is you lose the natural conversation that flows around intergenerational policy, uh, intergenerational poverty and transfer of wealth. And um, what's interesting about what you just said, Work, is when we think about that, we're often thinking about parents looking down, but you're talking about the other direction, young people looking up for that pull up um, in this moment. Um, and uh, I, I do think we need a new language to think about this idea in the context of health. So what you said earlier around policies that make wealth less important or that um, are, um, or that do, uh, uh, don't do as much harm in terms of causing greater inequality. Um, I think there's something, I think that may be the, the, the link um, but, but yeah, I don't think, unless I missed it earlier this morning before I flew in, I don't think I've heard the word poverty mentioned once in this uh, convening. Um, and I think that's a miss. I think we need to think about how it connects. Great. Yep. Do you have a mic? Yeah. Very loud. Okay. Um, I'll be loud. Um, Oh, there's a mic here. Sorry, ahead. thank you. <laughs> You're the next one. Hi, I'm Lisa Miller from the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship. And unfortunately, I can't share my experience because I'm not a millennial. Although, when you talk about student loans and saving for retirement, I can absolutely relate. I think um, the, the point about trust really resonated with me. And as someone who's older and considers himself to be relatively mature. Anytime I get one of those phone calls about, you know, you can pay zero dollars and stay afloat or refinance or any of those things, I immediately hang up the phone. So what can we do to educate millennials and young people in general about what the real options are to help them be more financially healthy? Yeah, I mean, part of the underlying reasons why there is distrust of those calls is because they were dis they are disproportionately fraudulent in other sectors. I mean, that that is true. You are when being told to selling something that sounds too good to be true. It often is. I'm not just talking about financial services, but more broadly. 
And so I'm not saying fraudulent in a legal sense, but you know, the auto dial saying I've got a free trip for you if you do X, Y, and Z. You know, that's a tough thing from an enforcement perspective to root all of that out because it's always gonna pop up. There's a, that's been existing for centuries. I think where there's a, a little bit of, again, a disconnect is the person or company you, you do have a relationship with are you necessarily getting that clear information? And I think the whole transparency issues that were raised earlier um, kind of get to that. I, I think part of it, though, is um, on a related note, mental accounting, you know, in, in behavioral finance, they sort of think about how are people actually accounting for their income and their assets? And what's so funny is that Americans have always had this belief, which is not really true in continental Europe, that renting is throwing money away, and paying a mortgage is paying yourself. It's kind of not exactly, tr it's not totally true. Most of the mortgage payment you're paying is generally all interest on a loan. But what it's leading, and it, financial technology has made people think more in terms of their full balance sheet, not just mint.com, but everything like that. And I think what's happening is that people are now seeing they see a mortgage and a home as unattainable, whereas it used to be you had that and you were paying yourself. And now you see this big student loan you owe and you feel behind that you're actually playing catch up or that you're not really paying yourself for an asset that you earned earlier. And I think that skews people's risk tolerance and it makes people less likely to maybe even be an entrepreneur and it undermines further the kind of trust in the whole system. So it's, a, it's, a, it's multifaceted. I don't know if we'll ever be able to fix you know, the phone calls, but some of the other structural issues may indirectly get at it. I, I thought you were gonna give the CFPB commercial. Yeah. Right? You this, want to? I'll give it. Yeah, I will, actually, because you know, from the perspective of trust, it's not just private sector, it's do we trust the government? And the CFPB is trying to be you know, not your father's financial services regulator. Um, and among the many things it's trying to do, it is trying to think differently about how it educates the citizenry about making good choices. And they're trying to do it in a way that is very 2.0. Um, I think the jury is still out, but I also think that um, they're thinking very big about the role they could play. And I think it'll be really interesting to think about whether A, folks will buy it and trust it, and B, whether that will also help restore trust both in government and in, in the broader system. But I think there's a tremendous amount the CFPB is doing um, in that arena that I think is quite good. So there. <laughs> you ready? Ready. I'm still I'm still loud with or without a mic. I'm Mary Bruce. I represent AmeriCorps alums. Um, the about a million folks have served in AmeriCorps since 1994. I'm also a millennial cusper. I don't know if that's a term, but I'm on the millennial X uh, cusp. And I think to answer your question, I think one is it's very scary. Finances are scary, uh, and it is a scary time, even if we think it's not a scary time, and very confusing. And I think um, the, the gentleman from NerdWalt raised a lot of important points about even you can go and Google a million answers and find a and still not know what to do uh, or whether or not all your money's gonna go away tomorrow. And I think the other thing that is face, that I face and that the individuals I represent face is a perceived or real tension between being the me generation or the we generation. And individuals who have served with AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, or volunteer regularly or want to be a part of addressing the many community challenge we talked about this morning, and that time and money are our two most important things. So are you working somewhere that is corporate, that has strong CSR policies? Are you working at a nonprofit that isn't going to pay you as much? It's hard to save when you're not making any money. Um, and how we're thinking about philanthropy. So Mint.com doesn't have a, that you can tag something as donations, but there are how are we talking about donor advised funds for small, um, small donors? So I'd love to hear a little bit more about trends or thoughts around um, the, the tension between my own financial security and what that means as a responsible citizen who needs um, the flexibility in the workplace to be on a nonprofit board or to work at a, a volunteer at a nonprofit or be, uh, have those opportunities to continue service. Okay. Hmm. I think it's a really interesting idea, but I don't, I don't, 
I think it's a new idea, honestly. I don't think, I'm glad you're raising it because I don't think a lot of people are thinking about that in the context of finances. Where it makes me go is someplace slightly different, which is thinking about, which is in this panel, right? Which is the contract between mm -hmm. the employer um, and their workforce at a time when this is really the 1099 generation and mm -hmm. folks who are, um, um, forget about entrepreneurs, they're freelancers, which is a very different kind of thing. And, um, you know, so sort of how do you live the life you want, both in terms of having the financial security and benefits you need, but also having the flexibility and, um, in terms of time and ability to contribute in other ways. Um, on, on the one hand, that uh, the 1099 Society allows for that in a new way, but it, there's still not enough security that comes with it. And I think that's going to be a very important, an important conversation to be had. I, you know, I think um, this is not tongue in cheek, but I'm always amazed how um, AmeriCorps members are actually able to put together very stable financial plans for managing their AmeriCorps year when they're living on a very, very small stipend. And we know, and you'll hear a little bit more about this tomorrow um, when Wendy Spencer comes to talk, but that the power of service and community engagement, actually there is a direct correlation and there are some, some real data that shows how it can impact um, employment opportunities. And I think we need to think about this as a teachable moment. When people are ready to make an investment in their own future and the future of their community, that having a financial plan becomes part of integrated and a piece of that process and not something that we just think about, you know, separate and, and devoid. And I think integrating where we can help people to be aware and conscious of a financial plan, um, we need to find more of those teachable moments. Okay, thank you everybody.